Sometimes this is a this is sent in from um, someone who wants to be anonymous, which is totally fine. We're all for that. Um, sometimes due to ignorance or a lack of education or awareness, churches can promote marital sexual abuse with phrases like don't deprive him or don't say no to your husband. Two questions out of that. How can people recover from this form of spiritual abuse? That's a big question. And the second one is, how can churches address this if they've preached these messages in the past? Nick, you want to start on this one or you want me to dive in? <laughs> hey, if, if you're ready, I'm, go for it. I'm, I'm always up for okay. jumping in. Um, you know, first of all, if you've been hurt uh, where scripture has been used in a way that uh, favors a male dominance, on behalf of the church and a leader within the church, I sincerely apologize. If religion has in any way made you feel less than or manipulated you or somehow your whole life is to just serve uh, you know, a spouse in that regard, especially in this case, we think about a female to a male, but it could be maybe uh, another way as well. So um, first of all, I, I would simply say a one this, is that we're both reflect the image of God, male and female. And mutual uh, submission is a beautiful thing. It's what the scripture talks about in the book of Ephesians. Submit one to another. So mutual respect and mutual submission is really should what be taught in churches. And unfortunately, uh, we take, I think, those scriptures out of context and use them as a way not to first start with respect, but uh, they see it more as a duty scripture. And I think that's not interpreting uh, the scripture correctly. Um, also just other centered self-giving that's a sign of maturity in our lives where, um, as we mature, we prefer the needs of one another. And, uh, in a marriage relationship, men are called in a leadership role and leadership just means go first. So it's us submitting to our wives, us, um, meeting their needs first. And I think the church too can also just admit mistakes, uh, if people have been hurt and bring some clarity to the subject matter. And, uh, Go seek some outside help if you feel like you're not getting that clarity from your church. There's a lot of good ministries and organizations um, that can really help. I know our, our B and B and Unraveled resources are really great about self-respect and uh, good communication in that regard. Yeah, that's what I was thinking along the same lines, Rodney. There's there's really two sides of this question because the one is if I'm feeling uh, abused by this, what do I do? And I think I would answer that the way we might respond to any form of abuse to say you're going to need support. You may need a professional that you can talk through with it. What does it look like to recover from this and the trauma I felt? Um, and you're going to need community. You're going to need a group around you that can understand what you're going through and, and point you towards health and growth and maturity. And I think, unfortunately, many people that have been really hurt by this kind of language have left the church because they feel like there's no other alternative. And I would say that that may be a need to leave that current church if that's truly a philosophy they keep preaching and advocating. And, and you can see there's error in it. But, but I, I would just say that's not the, the word of God or the body of Christ as a whole. And so another thing I, I find is helpful is if, if you have Christ followers that you really respect and uh, are close to, to wrestle together, what does the word of God mean in 1 Corinthians 7? What do I take out of Ephesians 5? Because it's, it's an unfortunate conclusion if we just you know kind of like staple those pages of our Bible shut and say, well, this has been used for abuse, so I just don't even read that or believe that. Well, no, there, there is, as Rodney was bringing up, some really beautiful application of mutual submission. But unfortunately, many churches have kind of ignored other, <laughs> other scriptures about, you know, the way that we build trust and safety and uh, that our bodies matter and, and all that has to be taken into account. Now, on the, on the flip side, if we feel, boy, we've been a part of perpetuating those messages, I, I think just what Rodney said, there needs to be humility. It's okay to take ownership. It's okay to stand and say, you know, there's been a way we've approached this passage that I think has been taken to mean we have no voice, we have no say, we just have to be a doormat, and, and that's not the full teaching of Scripture, that this is really in the context of healthy relationship and of two people that are committed to the good of the other. And so let's talk about what do we do in situations where that's being abused or taken advantage of. And, and so I think just having that humility to learn and grow, and I would say finally a willingness to listen, because if we hear from people uh, even occasionally that say, you know, this method of preaching led to real significant pain and abuse in my life. I, I think we need to take that seriously and listen and say, boy, if, is that truly, you know, are they truly be, being offended by the gospel? Because some people are, let's 
you know, name that truth. But if, if what they're truly being offended, offended by is something that I'm preaching that isn't accurate to the gospel, maybe I need to learn and grow because I don't think the word of God abuses us. Um, I think it challenges us. I think it corrects us. But if it's leading to someone really feeling um, abused in its application, as the preacher, we may be missing something. And I, I think having that ability to yeah. say, I'm not perfect. I, you know, the word of God can be perfect, but I'm, my application and preaching of it is not. Yeah. And so to own that and to learn and grow, I, I just think is something we should be doing in every area. Yeah. Um, and especially in this one. I think this is another area that people can, and I, I, I'm guilty of it too, of villainizing the church as if it's this big, bad, you know, the big, bad, big, big C church or whatever, that they're out to hurt people. And I, I want to make sure that people understand that it's not like a, a pastor or a preacher is getting up there thinking, I'm, I'm going to say this and I know it's going to hurt people. I know it's going to be abusive. I think a lot of it comes from a misunderstanding of the actual problem or issue and um, how to address it. You know, like, I, um, like I've, I've already talked about this a lot, but in my experience at seminary, I was never taught how to help people walk through sexual issues. I was never discipled on my sexuality. And so for a lot of pastors, Christian leaders, ministry leaders, whatever, that are stepping into the pulpit, they don't have a lot of that. And so I think that they're operating off of this. It's not necessarily a faulty playbook, but it's not an accurate playbook. And so I think that in some ways there has to be some understanding. However, that doesn't mean to what we already said, that you have to stay at that church and continue to put yourself underneath those abusive messages. I like a saying that says manipulation is never the way of love. So Sometimes, unfortunately, even scripture can be used to manipulate. It's just not. It's just not the way love is. It's the essence of God. Yeah, it's it's an interesting contradiction because there are many places we're called to surrender. But as soon as my surrender to Christ, as soon as my you know surrender to the will of God is being manipulated or forced to me, it's no longer uh, a surrender. It's it's a very different thing. So uh, 